Hi, I'm Eliza Pellrine. I am the lead author, along with my co-authors Dr. Novacek and Dr. Boyer, on the paper titled Knee Pain and Crouch Gait in Individuals with Cerebral Palsy, What Impact Does Crouch-Related Surgery Have? Here, I'm going to do a quick walkthrough of our study and findings. So to start, pain outcomes after surgery for crouch gait and cerebral palsy have been poorly documented in the literature and have lacked good control groups. So we aim to compare knee pain prevalence after crouch gait surgery to those who had had non-operative management in this population. We hypothesize that knee pain prevalence would be lower in the surgical group compared to the controls. In our retrospective study, we used 3D gait analysis and knee pain questionnaire data from individuals who walked in crouch gait with both a baseline and follow-up visit that were approximately 13 to 20 months apart. The non-surgical group did not undergo any invasive intervention between gait analyses, whereas the surgical group underwent crouch-related treatment, including distal femoral, femoral extension osteotomies, patellar tendon advancements, and or hamstring lengthenings. Those in the surgical group could have had other concomitant surgeries. We ended up having 19 participants in the non-surgical group and 32 in the surgical group. In this graphic, we represent each individual as a box, yellow for non-surgical, red for surgical, and then the presence or absence of knee pain is indicated by a plus or a minus sign. At baseline, 21% of the non-surgical group had knee pain, while in the surgical group, almost twice that was seen at 38%. The following animation will show how each participant's knee pain status changed or didn't change from baseline to follow-up. For both groups, the majority of individuals who did not have knee pain at baseline also did not have pain at follow-up, and approximately half of the patients who did have knee pain at baseline also had knee pain at follow-up. In the end, about 16% of the individuals in the non-surgical group had knee pain at follow-up, while 34% of the surgical group had knee pain at follow-up. For our logistic regression model, we used crouch surgery, baseline knee pain, um, minimum knee flexion at follow-up, and age as predictors of follow-up knee pain prevalence, and plotted the output as odds ratios. Anything falling below a 1 would indicate a decreased odds of knee pain, while anything above a 1 indicated an increased odds. Since all of our confidence intervals included 1, none of these factors were statistically significant predictors. However, the higher point estimates that you could see for both crouch surgery and baseline uh, knee pain may suggest that they increase the odds of follow-up knee pain. Our study had a few limitations in that it was retrospective. The surgical group was about four years older than the control group. We had a small sample size, and finally, we only had knee pain prevalence data without other meaningful pain characteristics such as intensity or interference. However, we can still conclude a couple things. Crouch-related surgery does improve gait kinematics, but these gait outcomes may be independent of pain outcomes. And our preliminary study highlights the importance of ascertaining patient motives for treatment and counseling on realistic goals when discussing possible surgical intervention in the crouch gait population. That's all, and I just want to thank you all for watching.